no age limit. We should be seeking knowledge until we die. The moment we say, I don't need to learn anymore, that's the moment we have lost our way. Because there is always knowledge to be gained. No one can encompass all of the existing knowledge. It's not possible. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ had told us, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيدَ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ So that means lifetime. We seek knowledge until they put us in the grave. Most of you already know who this guy is, but for the 1% out there who don't, this is Dr. Bilal Phillips, an Islamic teacher, speaker, and the founder of International Open University, IOU. Dr. Bilal's story is special in so many different ways. Number one, he was born in Jamaica, the land of reggae music, and he was a bit born Muslim, like he had to find Islam. He was born Dennis Bradley Phillips, and he became Muslim at the age of 25. So far, this is like the longest video I've ever made on this channel. So I broke down the video into seven different chapters. You can skip through and go to the parts that interest you the most. But before we start, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. I was born in Jamaica, born in a Christian family, raised a Christian, grew up in Canada, moved to Malaysia with my family, came back to Canada, studied in university in biochemistry and became a revolutionary Black Panther and very much concerned about uh, Black nationalism, about African nationalism, and in the process, I accepted Islam. There were some Muslims, uh, converts from America, in particular, uh, brother, Dr. Abdullah Hakim Quick, you know, who does a lot of lectures also. He's a graduate from Medina. So he, he was among those who were uh, mixing with us young people in Toronto uh, concerned about uh, black nationalism and trying to put in ideas about Islam and uh, one of the members, female members of our uh, committee of our organization called the Black Youth Organization she converted to Islam So that started me to, to seriously look into uh, Islam. I had gone to the U.S., different parts of the U.S., been uh, mixed up with the Black Panthers there, and had come across the Black Muslims, you know, uh, which was Elijah Muhammad's uh, organization, which claimed to be, you know, Black Islam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was black mislam <laughs> in fact when i listen to their theology you know that black people are the gods of this world you know and uh, white people were created in test tubes by black scientists i said this is nonsense <laughs> you know so i that didn't interest me to to join that caused me to seriously start to look into islam and find out what islam was really all about. And uh, the book I read by uh, Muhammad Qutb called Islam the Misunderstood Religion convinced me that one book. Let, let me say that um, from the time I accepted Islam, I was concerned about understanding Islam properly. I wasn't satisfied with just having a surface understanding of Islam. So I sought 
knowledge which was available in Toronto back in the 70s, which was like this much, you know, a very small amount of knowledge. They were just Muslim immigrants who had rudimentary knowledge of the religion. It was more than I had. So I tried to get from them what they had. But as I was learning from them, I started to learn uh, that there were issues because I was told that there are four madhabs, which every Muslim has to follow one. Because if you don't follow one, your madhab then becomes the madhab of shaitan. <laughs> when I asked them, so majority of Muslims are what? They said Hanafis. Okay, so I said, okay, I guess the best thing is to become a Hanafi. Mm -hmm. And um, what I found as I decided to become a Hanafi and gain knowledge of Hanafi fiqh as much as I could to understand that others who were in my circle in Toronto at that time were from other places that had different rulings. This is the different rulings which were contradictory. But they were saying, no, these are all right. You should follow one. And all the rulings in that one madhab are correct. Each one is correct. But you should just follow one. Don't jump around from one to the other to the other. Like, no, no, you should be just following one. So when I saw that in the Shafi'i madhab, if a man accidentally touches a woman, his wudu is broken. But in the Hanafi madhab, if a man accidentally touches a woman, his wudu is not broken. Now I'm obliged to accept that it is possible to have wudu and not have wudu at the same time. <laughs> so this was, this was confusion. Mm -hmm. This is confusion because my, my common sense told me this is not possible. It's like God being three in one. So it's like going back to that kind of the mentality which accepts that God can be a father, a son, and a Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. Sure, yes. And yet at the same time, he's one and the same. You know, it went against logic and reason. Absolutely. You know, and I felt that somehow religion should make sense. So that put me in a position and discussing with Abdullah Hakim quick. You know, we both said we need to go overseas and study. And alhamdulillah, it was Allah's will that two scholarships were available wow. at that time to go and study in Saudi Arabia. And nobody wanted it. Was nobody was interested. Today, if you said two scholarships are available, you'd have thousands. But then nobody was interested. And even the brothers who were there would say, no, 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 you don't need to go to Medina to study there. They were using old books from, you know, thousand years ago with dust all over them and everything. You know, this is irrelevant to the current situation. But Abdullah and myself, we decided, no, we're going. We're going to go and seek that knowledge. If it turns out to be old books with dust all over it and information which was useless, then of course we'd leave it and move on. But of course, alhamdulillah, when we went there, we came to find that it was a treasure house, a treasure store of knowledge. So we both studied and graduated, him being the first from the USA, and me being the first from Jamaica, Canada, to graduate from Medina. Alhamdulillah, that was in uh, 1980, we both graduated. In that process of teaching, I started to learn also the elements of da'wah. Both of my parents were teachers. In fact, they were in Riyadh before me. And they had set up an English medium Islamic school, though they were not Muslims at the time. And uh, the teacher who was handling Islamic studies in the school at the time had quit and gone back to Canada. So they asked me if I was willing to take over this post. So it was fine for me. It was a good means to earn uh, finances and, you know, begin the process of passing on that knowledge. And because the Prophet ﷺ had said, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَ So the learning part is what makes you prepared to be the best. But the teaching part is what ultimately makes you the best. So, and that's of course where we wanted to be. 
You know, this was the, what the teachings were geared towards, learning and teaching. As he said, So with that in motivation, I was keen to teach. Uh, of course, I soon found out that there were no books prepared for teaching in English, mm-hmm. Islam to high school, junior high school students mm-hmm. or primary school students. Mm-hmm. So I started preparing the foundations for books in uh, from grade 7 to 12. I started preparing my notes with the help of my parents guidance because I wasn't a writer. Really, that was not my inclination. My inclination was science, right? I studied biochemistry in university. So it was my parents who guided me in the writings, helped to shape my approach to writing. And alhamdulillah, you know, I prepared up materials which was used in the schools and continue to be used till today. From there, I moved in, from Saudi Arabia in 1993, as after 20 years in Saudi Arabia, I moved to the UAE. And in the UAE, I set up the first Dawah center in the UAE. And I should say that actually in Saudi Arabia, before I left, I'd set up the first Dawah center in Riyadh, in Batha, in Riyadh, uh, along with some other Saudi brothers. We set up a, a Dawah center and I was engaged in Dawah also. So outside of being a teacher, I was engaged in giving Dawah, mostly at that time to Filipinos, those who were most inclined towards Islam at that time. So um, in the UAE, I, I, I uh, continued to uh, be engaged in Dawah. I joined an organization called Dawr al-Bir. And I set up their Dawa center for them. I also set up the first Juma in, in, in English in the whole of the UAE. Mm. You know, Juma was in Arabic and it didn't make sense to me. You know, here are all these people from Pakistan, India, mm. you know, who know no Arabic and they're sitting through the khutbahs mostly falling asleep, <laughs> right? Mm. So I said, you know, why not? you know, deliver the khutbah in the language of the people. That makes more sense. So Alhamdulillah, I was able to convince, you know, some uh, people, officials, etc. And they said, go ahead. So in Sharjah, I set up the first Juma in English place was jam packed out in the streets. People were praying, mm-hmm. you know, Alhamdulillah. And from there, they did it in more masjids, etc. across the UAE. I was in, engaged with communicating with a lot of people online and people kept contacting me and asking me about a particular website called sunnipath.com. So sounds good, sunnipath.com. But when I went there and I looked at it carefully, I realized that it was the sufipath.com. This was a problem. Right? Because I understood Sufism as a deviation. It is not the Islam which was brought by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu It contained some elements, but it was not the Islam, we could say the pure Islam, which was brought by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu But I felt shy when people would ask me, can we study in this, this website? So I would tell them, well, okay, Maybe you can study uh, Hadith, you know, okay, you can study Arabic if there's Arabic available, you know, but don't, don't go to go Aqidah, to Aqidah mm-hmm. you know, stay away from Aqidah. Mm-hmm. So that's the best, but I, I realized that obviously something needed to be done. This was, you know, becoming widespread. Uh, so an alternative need to be d- developed. So this is when <clears throat> I tried to launch a website, islamiconlineuniversity.com. That's I-O-U.com. There I tried to gather knowledge from what I had studied uh, with lectures, etc., and make it you know, now available as an alternative 
to sufipath.com. And in that period of time, uh, 2007, 8, I was going to India where the peace conferences of Dr. Zakir Naik was just beginning. So in the early days, I was there giving lectures to crowds of 200,000 people and, you know, huge numbers. And after analyzing the conferences that were being done, I spoke with some of the businessmen who were involved in South India's portion of the peace conference that the money that was being spent in these conferences was so great that they could set up their own university on the ground. Mm. They were convinced, yes, it made sense, we can do it. But we were only going to do it if you're going to head it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I agreed to head it with the objection of my wives at the time because India was the land of shirk. You know, when you get off the airplane in India, the first thing you see is an idol in the airport. Every turn you make, there's an idol, a different idol. There is. It's the land of idolatry. Seriously. So, but I told my wives that um, uh, if that is what is required to set up that university, I was prepared to do it. So, Alhamdulillah, in Chennai, South India, I set up the first recognized Islamic university in India. Well, it was offline, it was online. So I was intending to try to make it like the university in Medina with students coming from all over the world. But uh, the authorities, Indian authorities, would not allow me to do it. Once they saw what I was trying to do, they didn't renew my visa. My visa was running out, and their move was to not renew it when I tried to renew it. So I was stuck. I couldn't get back to India. So now I decided to go online completely with the Islamic Online University, which I had been experimenting with earlier, with whose concepts were I developed with K at KIU, Knowledge International University. I now la launched the Islamic Online University uh, as a, a full-fledged university. Got professors from different parts of the Muslim world to teach different subjects. Basically, it was a Sharia university. That's where it began. It's a Sharia university. But I felt that when I looked at myself as a graduate from Islamic University in Medina, and what was demanded of me as a graduate, people wanted me to lead their communities, but I had no knowledge of management. Because if you're going to lead, you have, you have to manage the community. Then they wanted me to teach in school uh, at that time when I graduated, but I didn't have knowledge of teaching. I later on learned that in Riyadh. They also wanted me to solve their problems, you know, marital problems, family problems, you know, communal problems. But I had no training in counseling, you know. So I decided, you know, really, this is what was being demanded of me was the same thing would be that, that would be demanded of any graduate, that we needed to include other subjects, which are not specifically Islamic studies subjects. So I introduced into the curriculum of Sharia, you know, that the students had to take um, courses in computer science so that they would be up to date with what's happening in the world. They had to take courses in Islamic economics, in education, in Islamic psychology. So I introduced these as minors that the students who studied in the Islamic Online University would get uh, as attached to their degrees. They had a choice of doing a, you know, a bachelor's of arts in Islamic studies with a minor in education or with a minor in uh, counseling you know, or, or Islamic psychology, etc. So this was the, you could say, the innovation that I did to the 
courses of Sharia when I set up the university. So your background school in the class is from uh, Madrasa background. Yeah, meaning the Arabic schools. And uh, of course, if you have any issues, you know, don't be shy to share them. You know, raise the issues to uh, the supervisor of the program, etc. Because the only way that we can improve is through your criticism. It's nice to hear the praise, you know, praise makes you feel good, but it doesn't develop you, you know. Of course, all of the topics that we uh, had in the university, all the other courses, departments, they were all teaching their subjects from an Islamic perspective. I vetted the professors that we brought on board, made sure that they had Islamic consciousness. Because already, you know, economics is being taught universities all over the world. But Islamic economics wasn't. You know, um, psychology was being taught all over the world. But Islamic psychology wasn't, you know, and so on and so forth. So I made sure that each professor who was hired had an Islamic consciousness and a desire to want to share uh, that consciousness with their students. Right. But why do you think that is important? Well, because that's the way knowledge was delivered in the golden age of Islam. You know, we know the history of Islam, where the centers in Baghdad, Damascus, and, uh, and Spain, the, these were centers of learning for the world. The scholars, when you read their books, if they're writing on optics, like Al-Hasan ibn al-Haytham, mm -hmm. you know, which most people don't even know about, who was Al-Hasan ibn al-Haytham, but he was the master of optics. He designed a camera back in the 12th century, you know, explained how a camera would operate and all this. So the point is, the knowledge which was written in the writings of such great scholars, you would read, he would explain something about refraction, about how light splits up into different colors. You know, you can split it up with a prism which splits it up into different colors. That's where you get the rainbow and all these other kinds of things from. Yeah. So he would at the same time mention, and Allah said in the Quran, so on, so on, so on, so on, so on. Yeah. And then he would say, and the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said, so on, so on, so on, so on. So you would see that interwoven into the text that they were teaching. So that was the way to teach. Islam was interwoven into the modern subjects. And this is what we have lost today. Because the modern subjects now were taken over by Western civilization, which became secular. And their issue was to remove religion from the classroom. That was their cry. You know, remove religion from the classroom. People should just learn without religion. But the problem is that Religion contained morals, teaching people right from wrong. Today, in America, you know, where you have every week, some kid takes a machine gun and he goes and shoots his classmates and the principal of the school and his teachers. How? 15-year-old kid, 13-year-old kid, 12-year-old kid gets a gun and goes and kills his classmates. What kind of mentality would produce an individual who would do that? It's a mentality of, of somebody who has no moral compass, no understanding really of right and wrong. It's just whatever makes me feel good is right, and whatever makes me feel bad is wrong. You know? So the idea then is to bring morality back into the classroom. So everything that is taught should be taught with the Islamic moral perspective. Ah, Siddiqui. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. How are you? MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. So, as I was saying, 
this was the driving force in expanding the university's curriculum. And at the same time, I was concerned with ensuring that we had proper accreditation. So that took me to the Gambia because I was in the UK, in Canada, and there I met a Gambian who befriended me. We became good friends. I would go to the Gambian community and give lectures in their masjid and khutbah, Juma, and all these other kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And eventually, when they found out that, you know, I was visiting Canada, but when they found out that I wanted to uh, get accreditation, they told me, oh, you can get it in the Gambia. Mm -hmm. You can get it in the Gambia very easily. Mm -hmm. You know, we have connections, you know, we family connections and, you know, sheikhs that we know well and so on and so on. He and the imam, etc. The local imam there assured me I could get it in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, that was 2013. Mm -hmm. And now nine years later, we finally got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I had gone to other countries in Africa also, mm -hmm. you know, trying to set up uh, efforts to gain accreditation. But Alhamdulillah, Gambia was the most responsive and um, alhamdulillah, we've completed the accreditation of our, our bachelor's level uh, subjects that we offer. And uh, we're working on the master's now. Next year, we should finish that off. And we'll go on to PhD also. Now, uh, the university, having set up its base, its, cap its headquarters here in the Gambia, you know, we, we looked at the need, not only in Africa, but in, in th the, what they call the third world or underdeveloped world in general. We made the accessibility of education in the Islamic online university, we made it uh, accessible by reducing the costs for studying in university. Uh, in the Gambia here, where a degree from UTG is about $4,000 for a bachelor's degree, from the Islamic Online University, it was and, and is $1,000. It's one quarter, you know. So we have reduced it. And of course, uh, UTG is a government university, not a private, private university. Then the prices will be many times over that. Yeah. So we deliberately made it accessible by reducing the cost. But reality is that even with that reduced cost, there are still many who can't afford it. So in 2017, we launched a uh, scholarship program for, for youth, young people who couldn't afford higher education. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, my name is Mona Lamin Sanyang. A uh, computer science major in the International Open University. I am one of the beneficiaries of the One Million Africa Scholarship, abbreviated as One Mass Africa. And this um, scholarship has helped me a lot because the financial muscle was not there in the first place. When I was um, having this nightmare how to obtain a degree in computer science, but with the availability of this um, One Africa Scholarship Program, initiated by Dr. Bilal Phillips, I was definitely I mean, among the beneficiaries and it has um, improved my life, my tech skills in particular. And then it has gotten to a level where I mean, IOU has definitely um, put us as students in the spotlight of exposing, having that exposure outside the world. Um, currently, um, we are being chosen by the Indian Ministry of Education um, to represent this great institution, International Open University, um, to partake in an international event in Guatan Buddha University. So without the scholarship, the One Mass uh, Africa Scholarship, um, uh, I wouldn't have been there because in the first place, I don't have the financial muscle to pull up and then obtain my degree in computer science. But Alhamdulillah, I mean, uh, through Allah, um, things were able to be sorted as how I wanted it. The 
the UN has already pointed out that the difference between the developed countries of the West and the impoverished, underdeveloped countries of the East is education. That is the major factor. So it is about getting education to the population. And the IOU changed its name from Islamic Online University to International Open University, still IOU, but reflecting the fact that we are not just teaching Islam. Because Islamic Online University implies we're just doing Sharia and possibly Arabic. But we are now offering much more than that. So we changed the name, you know, about four years, five years back. We changed the name to International Open University. And we began to uh, give the opportunities of scholarships to impoverished African youth. We started a project called One Million Scholarships for African Youth. And, and we left it open to even non-Muslims could, could join. But it was primarily focused on Muslims because it's, the university is Islamic oriented, right? So point is now then to make scholarships available for African youth, we came to realize that just making the scholarship available is not enough. We have to provide for them learning centers in which computers would be available, electricity and internet would be accessible. So we started the, that project in 2018 on the ground. And Alhamdulillah, we have now more than 26 centers across Africa. Uh, the largest number are in uh, Nigeria, where we have 12 centers in different states in, in uh, Nigeria. We expanded the centers across Africa. And, you know, we're in the process of trying to get it in more and more. And we want to make really the Gambia the pilot project because Gambia has a small population. So if we can implement it successfully here in the Gambia, you know, it would be an example to other countries to, to follow. So this is what we're focused on right now. While expanding in other countries, we just went to, to Liberia and uh, set up a center there. And we're setting up a number of centers across Liberia. You know, and we have centers in Sierra Leone, etc. We have rented places in Jarasoma, for example. We have uh, just opened up a center about two weeks ago. And alhamdulillah, people are very happy there because they used to come all the way down to uh, Banjul to study down here. Mm -hmm. Now they, you know, the, now they've saved that. They can study right there in Jarasoma. And we're looking into other parts of the Gambia, Basse and others, where we'd like to do the same and pilot this idea in the Gambia. Well, in general, you know, it was happening from the time I began to give Dawah in Riyadh. You know, I gave a lecture in a stadium full of Filipinos, you know, uh, outside of Riyadh. Um, and the n name of the lecture was uh, The True Religion of God. After the lecture, about 25 people accepted Islam, you know. So that was, uh, you know, a, a moment, you could say, that really caught me that of the significance of the da'wah. Then the next, you could say, major moment for me was during the Gulf War of 1991. At that time when uh, uh, Iraq invaded Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and was headed for Saudi Arabia and the others, you know, um, and they were stopped in their tracks. Uh, American troops, half a million American troops were brought into Saudi Arabia, you know. And while they were there, um, some came up with the idea of trying to give dawah to the troops. So I was invited to go to the camps and, you know, talk with different Americans and so on. So 
about Islam and, you know, people were showing interest in this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The war only lasted for a week mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, then they were to be processed back out of the country, back to the U.S. Mm -hmm. So at that time, I got together a team and we set up a Dawa center in the main camp or, or yes, of the American American troops, right? And we had we set up. They had tents selling, you know, jewelry, selling clothing, and different, and we set up a, one a Dawa tent, tent which we called the Saudi Arabian Cultural Information Tent. Mm -hmm. No, we didn't say Dawa tent. Dawa, yeah. <laughs> if you put Dawa tent, then you. Just, said what you're going to do, you know, and then they're not going to allow it. Mm. So they'll figure out what Dawa is and, you know, but no, Saudi Arabian cultural information tent. So we had all these tables with books about, you know, the history of Saudi Arabia, its deserts, mm. its animals, its trees, its plants, its, you know, all the birds and all these other kind of things. And then in the midst of it, we had some <laughs> booklets, had uh, yeah, booklets mm. about Islam here, why Islam and so on and so on. So, that effort, you know, and what, what happened was we used to bring in groups of, of American troops at a time would come in and I would give lectures to them. There were a couple other brothers with me, you know, who would help to warm up the audience and, and um, you know, help to convey the message of Islam to them indirectly. We talked about Saudi Arabian culture. Of course, Islam is integrated in Saudi Arabian culture. culture so yeah. you end up talking about some things about Islam. Mm -hmm. So they would ask many questions mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. They would ask many questions and that would expand the topic. We made it open for them. They would ask about anything and everything, you know, what, what you wouldn't even think to ask about, they were asking about. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was uh, a, 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 you could say a, a Dawa moment when we saw, I saw that kind of interest that people had. And then, you know, people started to accept Islam. So in the course of five months of Dawah, we had more than 3,000 American troops accept Islam from that one location. Uh, that was the impactful Dawah moment. You see the power of the Dawah. So this also made, brought about a big change in the, in the American military. And the rate of people accepting Islam just doubled and tripled, you know. So, alhamdulillah, that also was another moment, you know, of the power of da'wah and, you know, how it can reach where you would least expect it. You wouldn't imagine that this would be a force. And it continues to this day to be a force. At that time, when I was 21, you know, I wasn't yet Muslim. Yeah. So obviously my advice would be, find out about Islam, yes. you know, and be patient with your family. Because from the time I accepted Islam, I began giving dawah to my family. And my parents both accepted Islam after 21 years of dawah, wow. you know. So patience, you know, as they say, is a virtue. And the Prophet ﷺ had said that whoever was given patience has been given, you know, great uh, blessing by Allah. So we, we need to be patient in the process of seeking knowledge and then patient in the process of sharing that knowledge with others. So as a young Muslim in this generation, where we are always, you know, we are on this hustle, the grind, you know, making money, da 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 da. Like, how do we find the balance between Dean and Dunya, where you are on that grind, but at the same time, you know, not forgetting your Dean? How do you find that balance? Well, that's a lecture in and of itself. <laughs> but um, just generally speaking, to find the balance between the Dean and the Dunya. We have to find the balance in the deen and in the dunya. And then once we've found that balance in both, then we can have the balance across both uh, poles, 
the balance in the deen is holding on firmly to the Quran and the Sunnah. The balance in the dunya is choosing appropriate areas of learning and implementing one's study in a way which is pleasing to Allah. So with that together, inshallah, the balance will be there as Allah described the Muslim Ummah وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا Be around those who are concerned about the religion, you know, because the Prophet ﷺ said, Beware of those who you choose as your friends, because you will be raised on the Day of Judgment with your friends. So if you have friends that are, you know, off and crazy and whatever else, I'm sure you wouldn't want to be raised on the Day of Judgment along with them. So it's better to avoid them in this world, in this life, as much as you can. Try to help those who have strayed, have gone astray, and try to be around those who remind you of Allah and remind you of the deen. You know, because uh, your friends will determine uh, who you are in the end, you know. If you're a righteous individual, you will attract righteous people and your friends will be righteous. If you're corrupt, you will attract corrupt people and your friends will be corrupt. <laughs>